appreciated nothing in Google or whatever that they are Again, in terms of context, as it is, is, what we have is the history of the city of man leading up to Lamech. It's, it's, it's the theme of human kingship, the abuse of human kingship, uh, coming to an end, I say, in, in the adoption of divine, from divine knowledge. And so what I see in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, is a picture of that ultimate stage of, of abuse of human kingship, it's a picture of the, the ancient royal court with its royal harems. That's what the text is describing. Men saw, the sons of the gods saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, and they took to themselves as many as they pleased. That's the picture. The building up uh, of the, the characteristic feature of the ancient royal tyranny court uh, of the, the harem. And uh, in other words, here again is the same complex of the threefold sins of Lamech. Lamech abused all the institutions of God, marriage, the state, and then finally his blasphemy against God. That's what you've got in Genesis 6. The sons of the God, God abused the marriage institution on a huge scale by the, the, this brutal appropriation of women from all over uh, in their harems. And uh, then secondly, they abused the state, as you can read here what's going on here, and there's all kinds of violence and, and, and oppression that's going on, so that the Lord looks at the situation and will not tolerate anymore. So that uh, the day two in the name of justice on our producing tyranny and oppression in the world. But the big point, what was the big sin with Lamech? Divine kingship ideology, the Antichrist, the syndrome, he took himself in the name of God, the sons of the gods. That's what that's pointing to. The title that is ascribed to them is the one that's taken out of their own mouths, their own self-identification. We are the sons of the gods. We are divine beings. They identify themselves. And uh, that's you know, the point of uh, chapter 10. It is, the, it is the, 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 this correspondence between what is said of, of the B'nai Elohim in Genesis 6 and what is said of Lamech there that I think is totally uh, convincing as to their identity. And so, as I understand it, now then, the story, having come up through the flood, sketches the final crisis, and then moves on from there. Question? Yeah, so I was just wondering, do you think this um, describes the arrangement of the second theory? The second that, theory? And that it's pretty clear it's abnormal after. No, the, the point then is that... Uh, it's pretty clear that the point then is that the, that the, um, the gibberine, which is one of the terms, for the, the offspring are, are mighty ones, and so that's the, your best clue as to what it means. And uh, more specifically, then, for example, the next time that that Hebrew term appears in singular form before, it's in the, the chapter in, in Genesis 10, where it is describing the, the king um, Nimrod, huh? Nimrod, uh, who, who found Babylon and all, all that stuff, and he is described as a Gibor. <laughs> the singular of Giborim. And so that, I think, it tells us uh, what kind of people we are dealing with back in Genesis 6. We are dealing with royal pirate type uh, mighty people who then would tend also to be uh, physically uh, of, uh, of, of huge stature, something, you know, like think of Saul, head and shoulders above all the others. That's what's appropriate to, to, uh, to a king. So it's, it's that kind of uh, identity that is, is right on target here. These are Nimrod people. Um, Jesus in John 8, I uh, think he's sort of taking that sort of mentality of, of judges and kings, and he says, what they thought of themselves, I am in reality. Uh, what, what is the passage? Um, are you thinking of John 10? Maybe, yeah, I'm sorry, John 10. Yeah, with the quotation of Psalm 82? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, the, the Psalm 82 uh, that, that that Jesus quotes from on that occasion uh, is, as a matter of fact, part of the evidence uh, for the use of the language of deity, the Elohim term, hmm? 
it is part of the evidence uh, that the term Elohim can refer not just to God, capital G, but can also refer to human kings and judges. There's a series of passages in Exodus, another one, an interesting one, 1 Samuel 2.25, and uh, there's this Psalm 82, uh, within which uh, you get the use of the term El Elohim. It's one we're going to be dealing with in our prophet class uh, here in a day or two, maybe next week. And then Psalm 82, where uh, the El Elohim refers to God, capital G, who takes his stand in the midst of the Elohim, which is the angels. The angels are Elohim beings, because they're, they are made, it's not just man is made in the image of God, uh, angels are made in the image of God. And uh, the, that's why angels are called the sons of the God. That's why the first view that I was referring to is often adopted, that the text refers to sons of the God, and that's a term for angels. That's part of the case for that. But uh, Elohim, and it's used for angels, admittedly. But then in the passage, the verse that Jesus quotes from, it's uh, the uh, term Elohim is, is used for men, human beings who are, yeah, are, are kings on the earth. So it, what you're referring to is part of the evidence. Uh, uh, for my third view, namely that the language Beneha Elohim it could be a designation for human judges. It certainly is in the passage Jesus refers to. And uh, yeah, the, the, the logic of Jesus' appeal there, I, I, you know, that you, you call those to whom the word of God came Elohim, and then uh, why do you fight with the fact that the one whom the Father has sent is not the, the language of God? The Father has sent into the world, should call himself God. And uh, but yeah, it, 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 Jesus does set up the contrast that he is the one who is really Elohim, that they make Elohim claims, and to an extent rightly. So uh, I, the, 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 it's a complex uh, uh, logic there. I better not try to get into too much, but it's a relevant passage, I guess. What a clarification. The Elohim, does that, did you say it's also referring to the sons of Seth also? Or? That it refers to which? The sons of Seth. Uh, it, it, it isn't so much Cain or, or, or Seth that we're talking about here, it's kings, okay? It's, it's uh, referring to kings, whoever they were, uh, that adopted the divine kingship ideology. Now these, these kings are especially associated with the, the line of Cain, uh, you know, and for all we know there could be some in the line of Seth that were not the godly. Uh, after all, in the line of Abraham there's an Esau as well as a uh, as a Jacob, and so we are not saying that everyone named here is all of his descendants are necessarily saved. So, and as we just said, they, they too live in the city of Ban, so conceivably some of the descendants. So I wouldn't want to put it that way. I just make the point that kings, er earthly kings, uh, are the ones who are described as uh, the sons of. Now you can transfer Elohim, the gods, with a small g. You are the sons of the gods. Or in terms of this usage that I was just speaking about, where in, in an appropriate sense, those whom God privileges to exercise kingship on earth, which is a function so much like his own kingship, uh, uh, that it's a godlike type of thing. And so you might say that the earthly kings uh, uh, could be called sons of God with a capital G, just in terms of uh, not their spiritual character, but of their, uh, you know, their political uh, role. So when you mention sons of Seth, did you? For what purpose did you give us that information? That it could be sons of Seth also? That, are, that, that could be set up in Elohim? Yeah, all, all I was trying to say is that, that in the world that just it developed, there would be kings here and there and everywhere. And uh, we know that the Bible points uh, to the line of Cain as having notable examples of, of uh, wicked, violent kings. And all I was trying to guard against was the notion that there couldn't have been other kings in the, in the world that weren't the world's best at fame, actually. It could have been descendants of, of, of Seth. Can you please comment on the extraordinary lifespan of the Antonines? Yeah, well, that will yeah. come in more appropriately. <coughs> I think we discussed it as it's 5 and 11. There are more questions. Give me up again if I forget this. This question? Oh, okay. Would you say this passage is conceptually similar to the early part of the Gilgamesh epic, where you have the king who is supposed to be the son of a goddess who uh, is taking the women of the city to himself, and so he's thrown out and goes and becomes a heroic figure. Yeah, well, it, it's not only Gilgamesh epic, but all of the, the uh, Near East, including in the 
between two much stepped up at this particular uh, period, you have the, the process. It seems like odd. That, that I think is, is part of the case I try to make out in my article, but uh, that's, that's difficult how they're referring uh, uh, to this, this phenomenon. Is that for this phenomenon, is that that's really the way that you would think world, uh, not just in Mesopotamia, where you're referring to, but uh, and, and Gilgamesh himself is, uh, is at least one of the keepers uh, in the period of this. And uh, uh, not just in Mesopotamia, but in Egypt as well, with the pharaohs, the sun god, uh, and the planet. So this is, this divine kingship is a common phenomenon in all of the, the places. Uh, where, where did you do your reading of the Gilgamesh? Uh, I studied it in undergraduate. Okay. It's uh, something that, that uh, will be uh, uh, self. Uh, yeah, yeah. I usually encourage people to read uh, a couple of works by uh, the fellow uh, Alexander Heidel. Did you use his translation of the book? I'm not sure to be honest. Yeah. And, uh, and, and this other one on, on the Babylonian Genesis, when we're talking about the creation phase. And then we refer to the Enuma Elish, uh, uh, the, the Babylonian Genesis, and the Oxford. Or Jerry was with you reading into that material. But let's see if we can just, just about time just to round out the first triad, evidently, by saying this then that having traced the history of the world that then was twice now, involving this chronological flashback or recapitulation here from. We have now come up again to Antichrist, and, and Antichrist means judgment, and judgment comes, and that's Division 3, introduced by Chapter 6, Verse 9. And uh, here now we get covenant specifically. In fact, for the first time, the, the actual term for me, the curse in the Bible. Now, the covenant reality has been there from the beginning. I said, right? The world has created a covenant uh, reality. And so there had been covenant. The covenant of grace has been introduced all, all already here in this first section uh, within it, uh, and then the promise of the messianic redeemer and, and so on. And so covenant has been there, but now we encounter covenant as, 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 as an actual term. And uh, so here is the covenant of salvation. As the world has been going ahead, a line of pain, a line of sin, <coughs> antithetical claims, they're claiming the world in their own name, the Sethites claiming the world for their God, and therefore because we are the, the kids of, of the owner of the universe, this is our world, we are the heirs of God, and that's the, the rival claims that go on throughout all history, and how, how to settle these, and uh, all the more so, because look how many are left in this line of Seth, they said, no, eight souls, all right? Eight souls in this particular, uh, the devil's about to crush out of existence this line. Why are they reduced to only eight souls? I think it's pretty evident that there's been oppression. These brutal tyrants have uh, made as their particular victims uh, those who are calling on the name of the, of the Lord. And so there's been this conflict now has come to this uh, final crisis and the issue now is resolved by the intervention of God himself. And so he subjects the world to a trial by ordeal, a trial by water, in, out of which the, the saints emerge triumphant and saved, and uh, the wicked are, are simultaneously uh, condemned. And uh, so that's the covenant of salvation that God makes uh, with uh, Noah and his family. It's the Ark Covenant, huh? It's uh, the covenant of, of our salvation, and uh, obviously very important. Before this third section is over, the transition will be made to the world that now is. And so having told the whole story of the covenant of salvation, the salvation in the ark from the flood, then it goes on and says, well, now here's the world starting all over again. And uh, so now God makes another covenant, not the covenant of salvation, but a covenant with the whole wide earth, not saving grace, but uh, not just common grace, and uh, establishing the order of things, the stability of nature, the order of society, and so on, up into heaven. You know? And so you get that covenant there, and then it concludes uh, with the oracle of Noah, which also sort of is transitional for all that follows because he sketches out the whole subsequent history, not just that covered in the book of Genesis, but in the rest of the Bible and also <coughs> in the New Testament as he pronounces curses and blessings on the three sons. But it's a comprehensive world history that's described there.
try to sign the uh, more things to come. Well, uh, tomorrow, Lord willing, we'll take it from the air. And then, as I said, the first topic that we'll deal with in more detail is the question of the genealogies in the 15th chapters and the question of the antiquity of man 